We're going to be talking about the blockchain. We're going to try to build upon the last panel and uh, keep it as interactive as possible and answer any questions you have. But I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Tony Pierce. I'm the co-founder of Reality Gaming Group. Uh, we are developing a game called Reality Clash. Uh, it's an augmented reality mobile combat game that uses the blockchain. Uh, we did an ICO over a year ago, so we're one of the first mobile games companies to successfully close an ICO and launch our own cryptocurrency. And part of my demo this afternoon is to show you where we are in the game and how it uses the blockchain. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Amsel. I'm co-founder of a company called Ownage. Uh, we started looking into Ethereum for games like two to three years ago um, because I have a background in both games and in blockchain. I've been in the space since two, 2012. Um, and as of about five minutes ago, uh, it was confirmed publicly that uh, we were one of the first blockchain companies to have been acquired. We've been acquired by a company called Fig.co, who are a US-based um, uh, platform for raising money for game developers. Hi, I'm Charlar. I work for Good Game Studios. Um, yeah, almost six years now, I do BD for, for, for Good Game. And we are not doing anything with blockchain, but I'm here because I'm personally interested in this topic. I, got, I mean, I'm getting almost every day another uh, LinkedIn request for advising an ICO. So it's pretty interesting to see how many scammers are out there. And when you look at the white paper and the project and, and the whole idea, it's like, wow. So this has nothing to do with, I don't know, like, it's not regulated, so that's why everyone is scamming. So I think it's very interesting to hear here in this panel how, um, yeah, how they use blockchain in the games and ICOs, etc. Hi, guys. My name's Dean Anderson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of GameStatics. So GameStatics is a new type of early access or co-creation platform uh, for PC games. So we're building a new platform that connects independent game developers with a carefully curated community of players which can be leveraged for content creation, organic marketing, um, ideas and feedback, all before developers actually release their games into platforms such as Steam. Given uh, Tony's got a great uh, example of a lot of firsts in the industry, in the last panel, they talked about mobile as just sort of this thing, just sort of separate, people are looking at it. And what's interesting I, th I find is that uh, Tony has got a lot of firsts and he, and he did those firsts on the mobile platform. So I'm gonna let Tony go ahead and, and, and show you what he's done. Okay, so... Um if I just, before I show you a demo, I'll take you through the stages of what happened through our ICO to post ICO to where we are now and what we're releasing this year. So as I say, over a year ago we did uh, the ICO, we raised 9,000 Ether, which at the time was about three and a half million, but this was way back before the, the market shot up. And um, the, the, we, all, we had uh, a white paper, we had the, the game design doc, we had demos ready. So when we went to the ICO, we were way ahead of most people, which at the time was just stuff on the back of a, a PowerPoint slide. So um, we, ha we got a very large community very quickly. I think the, the biggest thing that I would advise is really work on that community. I think everyone knows what ICO stands for. I would take the I out and call it community offering because it really is that important. And these guys have helped just virally build up the, 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 the community behind Reality Clash. So when we launched the ICO, um, we sold about four, well, we sold just over 14 million Reality Clash coins into the market. The price of our coin at the time was 20 cents. And um, with that, the money that we raised, we went straight into development. We now have um, 12, we're head offices in London where there's four of us. We have 12 developers in Brighton, which are making the main um, game engine, which is an augmented reality geo combat mapping engine, which I'll show you in a second. And then we have 12 developers in the Philippines, which are making the weapons that go into the game. And then we have 12 developers in Copenhagen, which are making the trading platform, which is a very important part of this game. So. Uh, I suppose eight months on, um, nine months on, we released um, uh, uh, a website that kind of gave people an update of what's happening. We got a huge amount of followers on that. And three weeks ago, we released a shop. 
And the shop basically is live now, so anyone can go onto realityclash.com and go into the armory, and you can see the weapons that you can buy now with our cryptocurrency that can be traded in two months' time or used in the game when it comes out in October. So I'll give you a quick, um, I'll give you a quick look at the, um, the store so um, you can see how that works. So obviously um, on mobile it's, it's much smaller than when you go into it on, on the website, but if you go into Armory Store, um, you will see here there's a whole list of guns as you scroll down. Now we released two guns a week every Thursday, so the community is like waiting for the next guns to come out. This got released two hours ago, and you can see underneath that gun, it says there's 26 of 30. So four have sold in two hours at 250 Reality Clash coins, which at today's price is roughly about $60. Um, so they, they, they go very quickly. And the reason they go quickly is because there's only ever going to be 30 of this gun ever made. And um, we, we also release them with different skins. We release these guns with crypto skins. We have our own Reality Clash skin. Then we have a, a Dogecoin skin. We have an Ether skin. We have a Phantom skin, which is ours. And we also have a Bitcoin skin. So, so they all come with different sort of crypto colors and skins. Um, you can, we've got pistols. We've got some really fun mag. I mean, th these ones, for instance, we've got 43 of 60 left, 320 RCC. That's $60, $70. Um, and this is um, a flamethrower, an ether flamethrower. So you can scroll through the guns that we've got. In the first three weeks, we sold just under 1,500 guns, average price about $40, 200,000 Reality Clash coins so far have been spent in our store, and that's with people that have either got them through the ICO or are now actively buying these through exchanges. So along with the, the website, which gives you more information about the game, the shop is incredibly important. So, and then complementary to that, we have a, um, an app which you can download, which allows you to almost try before you buy. So this app actually is connecting to the store with, with the same guns that you just saw. You can scroll down and you can click on any of these and you can see what they're like in 3D. You can see them close up, see what the skins are like. You can change the skin. Um, so this is our own one. Um, you can put a Bitcoin skin on it if you want. You can look at it really close up and take a look. And it's almost, let's see what it looks like then in AR mode. So you, this doesn't have any sound on, but you can go up and then you can see what it's like actually through the camera of the phone. Um, as I say, try before you buy. So none of this is the actual game. Um, I'll show you what the flamethrower is like, actually, because that's quite fun. So um, the flamethrower will literally change it, and then through that you'll see how the flamethrower works. And then um, you can get close up view, and then all of these have quite cool uh, animations in terms of reloading. So it's, it's not, nothing to do with the game, it's just, uh, as I say, try before you buy. The, the, the next thing that happens, once you've bought these, these guns, is they're logged on the blockchain. So this is where the blockchain part comes in. So you buy them with RCC through our store, we then log it onto the blockchain, we then email you back a certificate with a proof of purchase. That gun is then put in your account. Anyone can look into your account and see what weapons you've got, but actually you can't use them yet. The next thing that happens is in two months time, the trading platform launches. And that trading platform will allow you to then sell those guns to anyone that's interested in them. And so people are buying these now purely to speculate. I don't believe that many people actually are buying these weapons to play in the game which comes out in October. They're buying them because they know they're limited edition and they know that people hopefully will want to buy them for more because everyone's going to see this great Bitcoin gun. And that's it. There's, no many, there's none left. So the game itself... Um, actually is very different to that demo I showed you. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a game where when you download it, this is a very early demo. Um, the first thing that you see is um, uh, the teams of people that you can join and then you go through to um, this map when it connects. So this is now um, the main part of the game. And what will happen here, I'm the, 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 the white dot in the middle and then it tracks me down to where we are here. And then around it, you'll see some different color images. And these, these are either the enemy or people that are on your team. So if you click on them, you can see that this guy here, these are mock-ups, so they're all empty. So you can see how many kills he's got, how many games. You can see the guns that he actually owns. And if he's better than you, and you go into combat with him and you win, you win resources. And those resources allow you to come back into the store and get discounts off guns, ammo, and health. We then send you on missions. So the mission could be get across to Oxford Street, find something in an AR box, find that, bring it back without getting killed, and you win, um, and uh, similar to kind of paintball. Um, but the key thing here is, 
You can also go into your armory and you can buy additional add-ons at the top. You've got silencers and scopes, again, um, through in-app purchases. But the actual gameplay itself, when you go into the game and you see the map and you see someone you wanted to go to combat with, you, you say, I'm going to go into combat with you, they accept, and then a virtual reality portal opens. So you will never actually shoot someone directly, as I showed you in that earlier demo. One of the main reasons is Apple were very nervous about people walking down a street, shooting very realistic guns at people. So, um, and the second reason was the technology right now, is because of GPS signals, is very hard to track an accurate shot. So if I see you on, through the camera in a street and I'm shooting you, our servers will pick up the GPS signal of your phone, which actually could be the other side of the street. So we had to create something that was less violent and also something that actually worked. So when you go into combat now, you literally see a door appear and you walk into that virtual world and you're in a whole different universe. And the backstory to this game is actually all about crypto underground um, sort of Blade Runner style. So when you go into this portal, you're, you're in a, a whole new futuristic world and you're shooting the, the avatar of your enemy. And it's a full-on game and you can duck and it uses their AR kit on both um, the Android and the iPhone. Once that combat is done, you literally walk back out and the portal closes and you're now back in the real world. So again, there's no actual shooting down the street at real people. So already what we're seeing um, is an unbelievable amount of sales on a game that isn't even out yet. We're seeing how people are at reacting to the fact that they own that digital asset. They physically see a proof of purchase and the fact that they can then trade it and hopefully make money. So you become a virtual arms dealer in this case. And then there's a really amazingly cool game on the back of it. So we're kind of going in those processes. We're one of the first companies that have allowed any ICO investor to actually go back and spend their ICO coins. Um, we've been on target on our roadmap. When we launched the store, our token price went up 380% because there's actually a utility that you can go and use it on. It's not a, a, a scam, which you might come on to. There really is a real product. And when investors and anyone that follows this actually see something that works and is fun, that's when the value of the coin will start to shoot up. And um, that's really where we are. So, thanks. Thanks, Tony. Uh, shifting gears just a little bit, um, Alex, like, thanks for sharing the news on terms of the acquisition. Maybe you can um, you know, just share a little of the details in and around sort of how you came to, the, to uh, getting acquired and, and sort of where that takes us from there. Um, so uh, for those who came into me a little late, um, we're one of the first blockchain companies to have been acquired. Um, I, was, uh, I set up a, a games and blockchain company two or three years ago called Ownage. Um, we've been exploring the space in a few different ways. Um, and we've just announced about five minutes ago that we've been acquired by a company called Fig in the US, who are a community publisher and help developers raise money for, for their games through investment and um, reward-based. Um, and it, the way that came about was because we'd spent quite a lot of time looking at this area. Um, we, what we realized was that, and it kind of sounds dumb, but you're nothing without content, and there are far too many projects, and our own included to an extent, I have to admit, that were very focused on what the benefits could be for people who were investing or trading of items. And there wasn't enough benefit for developers, at a, game developers, at a wide scale. For, for individual games like Tony's, it makes a lot of sense, I think. And I think they're like brilliant ideas. But what we wanted to do was find a way to use blockchain technology, um, <coughs> including for things like ownership and trading, but where we could engage game developers more directly uh, and actually help solve some of their problems, including discovery, fundraising, not through ICOs. Um, so we started talking to a few different people to find a partnership. Uh, Fig were one of those companies. Um, what we found is that we had a great deal of overlap in our, our sort of five to ten year vision. Uh, their, their vision basically being community publishing, trying to make publishing more about the game developer community, about the community of gamers. And we realized they overlapped so well that um, in the end, they made an offer to acquire us, and, and that's what we're going forwards with. So, uh, Dean, you, you, uh, you come from a little bit of a different angle. Um, you've, you've launched a lot of, or helped sort of the success of a lot of AAA titles. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about where your, um, 
where you're going with this? Well, well, so my background is I've worked for a creative production agency in the UK for the last five years, and our clients were the majority of the AAA publishers. So we worked with Activision Blizzard, 2K Games, EA, and we would help create strategy around them taking their games to market. Um, and through working in that space, I've realised that there is a big space within the industry right now, especially around discovery, around the pre-release market, um, and working with independent game developers. Um, I feel independent game developers now need more support than ever. Um, and I also feel there's opportunity for players now to start to monetize their time and attention more than has been possible previously. So we started looking at it from, well, initially from the player side and in terms of what happens within platforms like Steam Early Access. So players have many different roles within the games industry. Um, some players will play for entertainment on the weekends. Other players will play for an audience or to promote games. Other players are actually creating user-generated content which is implemented into games and in many cases outperforming studio content. But it's very difficult for them to monetize uh, their skills. And so we started looking at, okay, well, how can we help players monetize their skills? Um, and one of the ways that we are doing that now is by allowing players to register user-generated content on a blockchain which can then be sold and licensed to game developers. Um, on the developer side of things, specifically talking about indies that are working on PC titles, they have some huge challenges that they're facing right now. Um, discoverability is one of them. Um, and the reason for that, in my opinion, is platforms like Steam have too much control right now over how developers do business and who actually gets to see their games. Steam don't allow developers to promote content within the platform. So if you're a small studio with minimal resource, you have to find the resource to go and pay a marketing or a PR team to actually market your, your content externally. Um, and if you can't do that, then it, it's very challenging to sort of get any traction within these open marketplaces. So we're building a platform that allows independent studios to connect with a carefully curated community um, who each possess different skill sets. So some of them might have large social following, so they'll be great at promoting content. Others, will be, others might be community modders, so they, they're actually good at building in-game items and assets. Um, other members of the community might be good at more simpler things like, well, I shouldn't say simpler, but... More, less technical things like community management. And so our platform allows developers to essentially search for, search and define a target audience in terms of what skill sets they're looking for, the type of demographic that they want to work with at various stages of development, and they can actually reach out to this audience and bring them in and start co-creating value with them. Thank you. Um, so Shala, you, you come here sort of as a somewhat of as a more of as an observer and a somewhat of a uh, uh, skeptic of sorts maybe you can just talk a little bit about some of your apprehensions or what just some of the stuff that you see happening out in the marketplace that uh, you know maybe gives you pause or the studio pause or say traditional studios that are looking at this as a possible opportunity but realize coming from that traditional set it's it would require a lot of investment they'd have to talk to the investors sort of tell them why they're shifting focus and have some real justification for it, given the risk? I mean, I mean, the thing is, like, I just ask myself very often, why do I need blockchain to build this game? Why? So, and this is, this is um, most of the cases, people want to raise money. That's why they are using the blockchain technology, because they know that they can raise money through an ICO. So the question is, What's happening? I mean, the, 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 the people who are investing in ICOs and projects, actually, they are not calling themselves investors. They call themselves contributors. Because actually, they know in the very beginning, they should know, actually, uh, that they might see nothing what they invested. They will never see any cent. They might not see any cent. Because many of the projects are not getting listed on any exchanges. So if you are not listed on an exchange and you invest 20, 30, 40 Ether, whatever, then it's gone. So, and um, that's why for, for I mean, a blockchain, uh, in general, it's awesome. So it's decentralized. I mean, the whole idea behind blockchain, behind Bitcoin, how that all um, came up, the whole movement, it's really amazing. But what people are making out of it these days with the ICOs, with the scams, and, you know, there are so many white papers are just copied from other white papers. So, and, and this is like 
when you read through, I don't know, I mean, for instance, um, there are at the moment four, five, or seven different uh, marketplaces where people can sell an in-game item. And there's another one, just copied another one, is now also going to raise money for that. So, and then the question is like, yeah, there are people who are not into gaming. Most of the ICO investors are not gaming people. They are like total different uh, audience. They have no idea what games are. I mean, just, just a few months ago, uh, someone was saying like, hey, we are going to do this um, in decentralized app store. So, yeah, how would that look like? I mean, they said like, yeah, there's no Apple, there's no Google, so people can decide themselves when they want to upload what. Yeah, what about if people are copying my game? Yeah, then it's, yeah, we have no one who is having control of it. So, so, so no one's forcing anyone to invest in an ICO. Of course not. Right? So, and when you say they get nothing in return, they do. They get their currency. It's like but, any crowdfunding. It's like any investor. Do your due diligence. Look at the team. See if the product's going to be real. And make your own judgment. If you're stupid enough to invest in a scam ICO, that's your problem. You know, don't do it. Right? Just go and see other investors. Ask to speak to the CEO. Go and meet the team. Do proper due diligence. And I, I think also that, that, that a lot of people did get scammed because they were stupid. Now I think ICOs, are, it's much harder to raise money. Of course. They're, 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 there's they're... much more detail in the white paper. There's much more due diligence on the team. And I think, I think that's a much better thing. And I think scammers are beginning to go away. The, 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 the reason I think people are nervous about it is because it is an open market. There isn't a platform like Crowdcube or Cedars or Kickstarter which has done the due diligence for the investor. Therefore, you go and do it. And I, I don't feel sorry for anyone that's been scammed. They shouldn't have invested. They should have done their homework. Yeah, this is a, this is a total... Uh, it's not a total different view on, on how people are getting scammed. But, but still, I mean, you know... Some people who are scamming, they are getting just, they're abusing the current system for people who are not having scams. If you have a great project, but you know, someone got them, is, is scammed three times, then you are getting zero money anymore. And that's what, I, what you said, it's getting harder to raise money because there are so many scams out there. And most of the people who are investing, invested in the past into ICOs, they didn't, they even don't know what a due diligence is actually. They just invested 10K and they made 200k out of it, and then they liked the project because they read the white paper, and they said, okay, why not? Maybe I can make another 10k. If not, it's still, you know, I will get my money back somehow, but are you guys listed, by the way, uh, on, on, on which exchange? We're on decentralized exchanges. On Etherdata? Yeah. So, uh, why not on the bigger exchanges? Uh, so, it's a good question. So, we, we've been asked a million times by our investors, when are you going to be on Binance? When are you going to be on the big centralized exchanges? Our answer to that is not until the game comes out. Because, okay, our store's just opened, so we could go on one now in theory. But our view is, where, where, where ICOs, post-ICO, where the token economics goes wrong is when you think you've got to be on a big exchange before there's something to use that token on. Because what happens is it goes on to the finances of this world, and your big investors immediately sell their coins because they just want to flip it, and your coin value starts to go down. And therefore, you spend 90% of the day looking at your coin value disappearing and not focusing on making the actual product you sh they funded you for. So we said we are not going on any exchanges until there's a product to spend it on. Okay, then why on Etherdata? Because it's decentralized. I can't help it. I, th it just goes on these exchanges. We don't want it to, but it does. Right? The bigger ones, though, is our decision. Or, in most cases, we have to pay to get on them. Right. So, so, so. No, if Bitfinex, for instance, wants to list your uh, currency, they don't ask you. They can just do it. Like if that, you can't do yeah, anything against they, it. No, you can't. But um, but th then that, your, that's your the can also do it. It doesn't need to be decentralized, right? For sure. But most of these bigger ones now would want would want to see trading volume beforehand or a really good okay, product, coming, or the community yeah, But then we're coming to another, a... another point, right? So because you said um, you can't help yourself, you are on Etherdata, you might also be on Binance, you can't do it. You can't do anything against it. So and then it might go down, as you were saying. No, but I, I couldn't get my coin on Binance unless I paid to get on there. No, if they want, they can do it without asking you, like Etherdata did. 
or not? Like, this is true, but, but, I, is true. but I just want to put a side point that anyone who is investing in crypto, using cryptocurrency to buy... They're speculating. Uh, yeah. Is that what you also pointed at, at, out? Yeah. At, at this point in time, then, the risks are well known. Uh, the trading is well known. The exchanges are well known. And a you know, buyer beware. And I, I don't think... I'm afraid I'm with Tony. I, I think that, that you, you've got an, you know, there is not an excuse now. There are plenty of review sites that review projects. But there then all, another, uh, there, there, there are plenty of review sites that review projects. There are now sites coming up which are. You can also pay for the reviews. Yeah, but there are now projects coming up that are like the crowd, you know, crowd, crypto equivalents of Crowdcube. Consensus have got one. And this is just an artifact of immaturity of a sector, especially a funding sector. Like, I, I do agree. I, I, but you I, know I, how many bounty hunters out there? They're just um, coming to your Telegram group and pumping your Telegram group to the next level because once the airdrop is happening, they just want to collect it and sell it immediately on Ether Delta because they want to make $5. Uh, so It's a free market and we all it know is, how it works. But it's also, you know, it can also mislead people. That's what I'm saying. And the, the other question is, why do you need um, for, for, for that game, why do you need blockchain? Every weapon that you buy, as I just showed, is logged on the blockchain. There's only 50 of a certain weapon. That's all that will ever be out there. So, again, you can look back into Ether, Delta, uh, back into Ether Scan and see that there's only 50. So someone knows there's a value there if this game really picks up. And if you want to buy it, it's, then, it's, it's logged on that user. But full game experience. You don't need blockchain to go out and play the no, game. No, no, no. This, this is just the trading. This is just the trading part. So, so we have... So on the, in, on the, uh, the other currency is the in-app store currency, but the weapons that you buy there cannot be traded. You, ha you can only trade them if they're connected to the blockchain. So, so there's a real reason for having it. But there's no reason to have it, to have the game on blockchain, right? I mean, the... the no, 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 no. Only no, this yes, part... That's absolutely the right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think just to get back to your original question, I think the main point now is, you know, these, if you're going to make an investment, whether it's an ICO or you know, you're doing an equity investment or you're doing crowdfunding, there's enough information out there these days to, actually, to do your due diligence properly. And I think if you haven't done that, then, yeah, I mean, it's your, it boils, what it boils down to is it's, it's your fault. I think you have to do your due diligence. Um, and going back to your point in terms of, you know, why is Reality Clash not on a big exchange right now? There's a reason for that, and it's because the game hasn't been released. So, he, you know, that's, that's a strategy to protect you as an investor in that token. If that, if that token was to be released on an exchange now, because the game's not out, there's no utility for that token, or there's limited utility, which is going to see the price fall. I'm just saying there are so many scams out there that people need to be, uh, you know, needs to do their home homework to understand, do their due diligence, even if they don't do it, they should, at least after this discussion, they should do it. So, because, you know, as I said, I'm getting approached like on a daily basis from, I don't know, a lot of uh, different um, gaming-related blockchain projects, but it's really tough, you know, I usually say, no, I don't want to be related to your topic because, I mean, I just need to read the, five, uh, the first five sentence of their white paper and I see it's bullshit. So, and I didn't see, I mean, I mean, there are really not that much uh, gaming related uh, projects where I think it makes sense to have this uh, on blockchain, to be honest. But of course there are some, like you guys maybe are doing. But, so, but, but I, I think in the, not now, in the future, and I'm talking between now and three years time, I think gamers will expect that the digital asset they're playing in the game is owned by them. I generally think that the days of you know, the World of Warcraft where, where in-game trading $5,000 a sword, because it's an exclusive sword, where that is really happening, but the person buying that sword actually doesn't own it, the game publisher does. All they're doing is licensing that, that skin to them. They can never take it out of the game and sell it. I think this is where the blockchain makes games a game changer. And I generally think that as As it becomes easier, I'll come on to issues that, that the, the UI right now and doing stuff is so difficult, but as it becomes easier, and we're working on making it easier for people to buy stuff, people will come to expect that that product that they're, they're using, if they paid real cash for it, belongs to them, and it will automatically be logged on the blockchain. Whether you know it or not, it, will be, it, it generally will become expected. 
Yeah, just to pick up on that, I think um, you bring up a good point about if someone's paying $5,000 for an item uh, and Star Citizen, I saw uh, yesterday or the day before, announced a $22,000 ship pack, I think, exclusively available to people who bought like a, a previous $1,000 packs. Those are the types of things that, to me, it makes a hell of a lot of sense for those to be essentially blockchain-based assets. So when you buy that spaceship, the Star Citizen spaceship, it actually becomes yours. Now, one of the arguments against this is, well, it only has value because it can be used in Star Citizen. If Star Citizen fails, then the item itself fails. Um, but if you have an asset that the ownership of the asset itself is in the public domain, essentially it's on public infrastructure, then actually there's other ways to give it value. It can have value just purely as a collectible. It can have value because other developers or marketeers decide they want to attract Star Citizen players to their game. Maybe they're doing a competitor. Well, they can also support the same asset, actually without permission. They go, well, if you've got a $5,000 Star Citizenship in Star Citizen, come to Space Opera 3, and I'm going to give you a $2,500 ship for free. You're going to have that just because you own it. So it, it, I think as Tony says, once you start seeing examples of this, the fact that it's on a blockchain will probably not even be known by gamers. Um, it may or may not be, depends you know, how, how we put it across to people. But the fact that it has increased utility and value to them, and perhaps resale value, with those medium and high value items, I think it will become an expectation. For low value items, I don't think so. I, I think it's, at least it would be, be in a different sense. But certainly for the high value items, it makes sense in an early stage. So am I, that would mean, for instance, I'm playing Game of War, and I have my castle, and I don't want to play anymore, then I take it to Clash of Clans. In, in theory. It, you can, in theory. Yeah, you can cross But back. do you think um, it's in the sense of the game developer, or does Clash of Clans want people to spend the money on Clash of Clans and not bring the item for, instead of spending 5K, only for 2.5K? So, funnily enough, that's, this is actually quite a big part of our project, so, and this is quite a major thing we have to deal with. You know, if you develop Clash of Clans, you don't want to lose your audience, and you don't want to lose your money. So, what you have to look at is, how, how can it work for large developers? How can it work for small developers? Um, how can you take advantage of cross-game assets within your company and between different companies? How can you permission access to um, something that's on a public ledger? So, I own the Star Citizen spaceship, um, but I don't, like, I don't want your company taking my customers away. Um, I can't really say what, how we're dealing with this, but these are really, really good questions that do have to be dealt with. Uh, and the, the truth is that I, I think that with the right software and infrastructure and the right tool sets available to everyone, there are benefits for all types of developers. Um, but it only works if those developers can monetize it and can protect themselves, and if gamers also start expecting it. It will, it, will, it will not work for everyone, and it will not work for every game. I mean, the thing is, currently, the whole gaming and blockchain, it's more indie style. Everyone are friends, it's a community, blah, blah. When you look at the big guys, there's big competition. No one wants to lose, as you said. No one wants to lose gamers. I mean, imagine someone spent in your game, let's say, 100K. They love it, and, but then after a year or two, they say, okay, I don't want to play this game anymore, but they spent so much money then they will not leave the game on a psychological um, you know, level. They will stick to the game even if they just maintain what they have. They still, maintenance means still, instead of 100K per year, it means maybe 20 per year. It's still okay for you, you don't want to lose this guy. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. It's, it's very, very project dependent, very dependent on the company, very dependent on how innovative that developer is going to be. Um, I just want to just change tack slightly because we're on the topic of of game items that are on a blockchain and how they can be used in multiple ways. Um, and, and this is an example of a way it can work. And in this case, for a brand owner or an IP holder, um, it was actually mentioned in the press release we put out today, but uh, we're working with the Gygax Foundation, who is Gary Gygax, and it's the, the IP behind Dungeons & Dragons initially, essentially. Uh, and actually, we're looking at ways to work with them as an IP holder to use blockchain-based assets across multiple projects. Um, because then it's not the same risk. It's, a, it's not the developer having to take risk with their product. It's an IP holder going, hey, we'd like some, some game items that we could use across multiple games. And in some IPs, that's going to make an awful lot of sense. And the developers who work on those properties, they'll just be expected and required, in fact, um, whatever the property is, to support some of those assets along with their regular business model. So it can work in different ways. I don't, 
it, it, it will require some innovation, and I think there are plenty of ways that that can happen. Yeah, this is, this is a magical moment for gamers. You know, this, it's got a long way to go. You know, taking a gun out of my game and playing it in someone else's game doesn't exist today, but it will do. The technology using that blockchain tech, the platform will make that happen. And I think the word blockchain puts people off because people don't understand it. Game, it will just happen in the game and people will expect to own something. And then they can go and trade it. And oh, guess what? Instead of your mum and dad losing 20 quid because they bought, you know, in-app purchases off the app store, they've now borrowed 20 quid and made 40. Thanks, mum. You know, so so it, it, it's, a real, it's, it's a whole different ball game what's gonna happen in the next five years. Speaking of the future, do you guys have predictions in terms of like where it's going to head up? So do you sort of have like different visions? Do you want to? I think in terms of blockchain within the games industry, I think you know blockchain is a great way to transfer value, and I think we will start to see through platforms like Game Statics, we will start to see more and more players becoming creators and actually being able to monetize their time and attention. Um, hopefully, to the point where you know people can actually make a living supporting developers and creating user-generated content and promoting content, I think that's, that's feasible and that's something that we're working on right now. I have really almost no future predictions <laughs> for, because everything can happen very fast. So as you know, I mean like the crash in January, I mean it's more uh, speculative things, you know what happened with the whole uh, market cap. It was uh, pumped during October till uh, January from, I don't know, 250 billion to 850 billion, and then it collapsed to 260 billion, just like that. So um, there are so much fat out there, and, um, but at the end of the day, the really good projects will definitely survive. And they will take a really, you know, there, there is definitely benefit in blockchain, and I'm 100% I'm sure that this, uh, this will be even developed further. For instance, there's um, this project in Berlin called IOTA. I don't know if you guys heard about them. They are, they are saying that they are doing a blockchain 2.0 with their Tangle system. So, and I think there is definitely opportunities in the future. And yeah, it's, it's gonna be really, really interesting. Um, I, I predict that within 12 to 18 months, you're going to be hearing about blockchain projects in games that are not about buying and selling uh, gun skins and trading. Um, there are a number of projects that are looking at everything from fraud reduction for large publishers and platforms uh, through to um, uh, management of data, uh, selling of data, uh, optimization of apps uh, through machine learning. Um, we might see it being used not just for fundraising, but also for um, uh, uh, cross-promotion of games within companies and for marketing and advertising. And so I, I think we, get, we won't know which projects are successful in that time period, but we're going to see an awful lot more that actually start coming out in public and doing their experiments with actual software. Um, it's going to take at least five years to get the, you know, even the early results, I think, of this. Um, as you say, the, the best projects or the good projects will survive. Most will fail, like any startup. This is a new technology that is... It is like the internet, in the, probably in the 80s, not even the 90s. Um, and there are many, many problems yet to solve. So right now, just everyone has to be aware. It is early stage, it's experimental. If you're putting money in, it's high risk, but the rewards are phenomenal if you get it right, uh, and nothing if you get it wrong. Um, but it's really, really exciting. There's some very, very smart people doing some amazing projects. I think at the moment, uh, it's... If I look at Reality Clash, it's very much focused on people that understand crypto because it's extremely hard if you aren't used to the process of... I mean, if I take you through the process, if you want to buy a gun and you haven't got our coin, first of all, you need to, with your bank account, go and open an, a, an account on an exchange. Well, that can take you three weeks and they do their due diligence on you. Once you've got that account open, you then need to, with your sterling, go and buy Ether. You then bought that Ether, you then take that Ether out to your wallet. With that, now you've got Ether, you now take that wallet into our game and now you can buy Reality Crash Coins. Oh my God, it's just so, it's very painful and full of friction. And that has to change, that UI needs to be seamless and very quick. 
And I think once that happens, you're going to get more casual gamers come across, and that's when you'll start to see the market grow. So at the moment, it's very focused, I think, on crypto heads. Um, the other thing is, I think the, the transaction speed of the blockchain has to increase. It's just too long. And the, the, the cost of microtransactions and the gas cost to do that is just too expensive. But I think all of those will gradually get better over time. Have to. Uh, I mean, CryptoKit has almost brought down the Ethereum network. I mean, uh, you know, that's one game on a big blockchain. So um, uh, things will get quicker and it needs to be visa speed. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, I also think we will start to see blockchain as a technology starting to take a back seat and, and what will become the focus will be the problem and the solution that people are providing. Um, you know, we've been working on the game statics for close to two years now and my focus has always been the platform, the problem that we're solving, you know, and, and the actual platform itself. And now that we're moving towards a token sale, all of a sudden, all the focus is on blockchain. And that's, in my opinion, that's not really where the focus should be. I think there's a bigger picture. Um, and I think as people, as blockchain as an industry and as a technology matures, I think you'll start to see many, well, you won't even see them. There'll be so many use cases for blockchain and you won't even know you're using blockchain. It'll just be there as an underlying technology. Um, and I'm, I, for one, I'm looking forward to that. I think right now there's, yeah, blockchain has kind of taken over many solutions and many use cases for it. I think we need to start focusing on some wider use cases for it as opposed to focusing on the value of tokens within exchanges and so on. Well, let's say gamers invented virtual currency. It's been around forever. All that's happened now is that virtual currency can be exited and sold on an exchange for fiat currency. That's a big change. I just want to ask you guys, because um, you're more into this industry and more familiar, would you share some numbers with us? How big is the, the market? Uh, how many daily active users has the top games? That's quite a difficult question to answer in one sense because the, let's say the blockchain gaming sector, and by that I, what I really mean is digital collectibles, um, <clears throat> has a very, very, very uh, small, small audience who have a very, very, very large amount of money. Um, and so that's how crypto cooters became successful. Had little competition, people with a lot of money. So I've done some research into how many game tokens are available today, and that's about 150. So 150 different games you have not necessarily done an ICO, but offer a cryptocurrency. And that adds up to a market cap of about one and a half billion dollars. That's today, that's the size of the market. But every day there's another five, ten new games that come out with their own currency. Okay, my, my question was more like how many unique users are doing the transactions in, in your platform, for example? Yeah, I think anyone going into this needs to be aware this is really early stage numbers of, you know, they're not going to be big. Um, well, some numbers aren't going to be big, some of the amounts will, will be large, but user numbers certainly won't be. No, um, it's okay, so. those numbers are way much better than uh, I have on, let's say, my VR company, for example. They're big spenders, right? So, so on average, $40 for an item? Uh, they, 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 it's estimated that someone with a cryptocurrency will spend seven times more than someone with euros. That's a stat I read somewhere. That, you know, that's just what they're happy to do. Yeah, I would expect uh, thing that you guys figure out how to do all these uh, numbers because traditional mobile game DAU, MNU just uh, do not apply to crypto games. Um, but the biggest challenge is still, you know, marketing discovery and about that kind of thing. But in terms of the payment, I mean, how good is it that all the crypto holders are already verified payers, right? In mobile game, PC game, there is tremendous obstacle in terms when it comes to payment. Anyway, so my question is, is more focused on, you know, crypto games, um, how to market and really promote and expand the whole ecosystem. Because this is very much, I see it as it, in the beginning of the mobile game as well, there will be tremendous drop-off rate when it comes to payment, when it comes to, you know, do the in-game IAP kind of things, right? Um, I think Tony had it before. Um, what you were talking about was the user experience. Um, it is absolutely horrendous for someone who's not into crypto to get involved with a blockchain-based game right now. Um, 
So, uh, you know, projects like yours are, you know, certainly going to address that. You're obviously looking at addressing that. Um, so that's one of the things. The second thing is, we talked about this just slightly before the panel, is that I don't believe, for this, for this to go mainstream, I don't believe most gamers or traders or whatever will even know they're using crypto. All they will be getting is whatever advantages there are. Perhaps it's tradable assets, and perhaps they're earning some, uh, earning some money that they can then spend on games. Uh, through, you know, through advertising models or through you know, selling, of, selling of items. And companies will, will make it look like they're just using dollars or pounds. And they'll hide, they'll hide or remove the problems of cryptocurrency, such as the you know, exchange rate issues, which are terrible, such as having to buy, register with an exchange or register with Coinbase and buy Ether or Bitcoin and then convert it. They'll, they, will, they will hide all that away. But we, to do that, we might have to make the user experience better. And we actually have to prove, because it's not proven yet, uh, that gamers and developers benefit from whatever this technology can provide to them. Um, so there's a multitude of answers. I think in terms of marketing a platform uh, like GameStatics or the platform that you're working on, it's also important to really define your target audience in terms of who are your users and, and what background do they come from because if you're, if, you're, if you're talking to someone who is heavily involved in the crypto community, they're going to want to know more technical details. You can lead more with the crypto side of things. Whereas if you're talking to the wider gaming community, right now there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of cynics in the gaming community and people are very sort of reserved around crypto. So in that sense, it's more about hiding, well, not hiding the fact that you're working with blockchain, but it's about focusing on, you know, the, the real value proposition to them as, as a gamer, as a player, as a developer, um, and not leading with blockchain and sort of forcing it down people's throats. Um, one of the ways we're looking to do that is to have multiple landing pages. So, you know, depending on where people come from and depending on their background, we can change our comm strategy. So we talk to them and we communicate our value proposition in a different way. Because if you've got people from the wider gaming community that have heard, you know, what you're doing, and they're just landing on an ICO site, which the comms is all targeted towards crypto investors, then they're just going to drop off straight away. They switch off. So you need to have, you know, multiple strategies um, and communicate different value propositions depending on who your audience is. And if you're a platform, you're going to have many different audiences. In our case, we've got players, we've got developers, we've got investors. But even within those, you can break those down further. Um, and it is a lot of work, but I think that's the best way to do it. This is why I love um, this new way of funding, the tokens and stuff. If you look at a, a business right now, right, if you look, there's, there's three parts to a business. There's the consumer. The consumer, all they want to do is buy the product at the cheapest price, right? There's the, the manufacturer, or the, there's, the, there's the employee. They want to be employed by the company at the best salary. And then there's the shareholders, and the shareholders of that company want to return on their investment. All three of those people are misaligned. Right? They're, 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 they all want their own thing. They're all after something different. What the token economy does is align everyone exactly the same, and it becomes a community. Everybody has a part of that business. And, and I mean, imagine if you could go into a, an Apple store and buy Apple products with Apple stock, with, with share. It's the same thing. You're, you're, you're now an advocate. Everyone's on the same line of building a community and making this a great business. And it is all about the community. It's very different to advertising to a gamer. It's about getting people involved and feeling that they have an have a ownership of this. And they do. Right? That they have a token that allows them to equally do something that anyone else within that company can have. Yeah, I just want to double up on that because obviously we've, we're now part of FIG and FIG are our community publisher. And actually that word community was the crux of it. Um, the, the economics you're talking about, the idea that whoever owns that token uh, benefits from the success of the overall project uh, is potentially extremely valuable because people are then, in, you know, your staff are incentivized. The community, you, you'll, give them, you'll give some of your community some currency, you'll give some developers some currency. All these people are incentivized to make it, to make it work. As long as the project is good, this project still has to be good. You've just got another incentive layer as part of your project. And it's a really powerful one when it comes to community. For developers, of brands, uh, of gamers, uh, of UGC creators, it's just really, really powerful. I, I think all these, whether it's a platform or stats or games itself, I think it's a lot to do with the trust, right? All these different community, different interest holders, they need to have their trust. And then, then you mentioned earlier, it's, it's, um, it's a lot of due diligence that need to do because that is a matter of fundamental 
matter is the trust, right? So, so due diligence, a lot of it has, it needs to be manually done because blockchain, no matter how powerful that technology is, is still not executing that part. So I think that the community, once that trust that somehow that layer and there are smart people to get over all these uh, obstacles, then it, I think the growth of the whole crypto uh, gaming industry will take on a more viral path to it. Yeah, as, as, as different companies get involved and hopefully gradually show some successes, that will also help. But you know, just having decent, you know, big brands involved helps in, in its own right because it legitimizes what previously was seen as the world of Bitcoin and drug dealers, basically. But it's, it will take time, and there will be failures, and some of those failures will be big. I think building trust for us is something you, we need to start building from day one. So you know, we will follow a similar path to an early access game, for example. So we will get the community involved in you know, ideas, feedback, development of certain assets, and get them involved from day one so they actually feel like they are a part of the platform. You know, they can really get behind and back it. It's not them and then this is the, and then this is the platform. It, they need to feel like it is one big community. Um, and in addition to that, for us, it's going to be about partnering up with you know, well-known, well-trusted developers and studios to sort of validate what we're doing. Um, so I think it's going to be a combination of tactics. So you guys talked about a lot of um, successes and what's going on, what you're working on, but are there, any, um, are there any aspects of the market that you see, I mean, you made predictions, but that you think there might be that, that are not being capitalized or you know, very big opportunities that maybe people should be looking at that they aren't or that they aren't talking about? Is there anything that you, I th you I think see out there? One big one that every platform or every, anyone who's working on blockchain is facing right now is the whole UX side of it. I think if someone can figure that out, that's a huge opportunity. Um, everyone's kind of working on it as far as I know individually at the moment, but if there is sort of one sort of larger solution that makes it easy for people to, to manage that and, and overcome that hurdle, I think that's a huge opportunity right now. I mean, opportunities, people are speculating, investing, hoping to find, um, I don't know, next clash of clans in blockchain gaming or in technology. If you look at the top 20 or top 20 in coin market cap, you will see that most of them are technologies. I think it's still, you know, if you want to um, invest and, you know, speculate, um, only invest what you are willing also to lose. That's my statement. Yeah, I'm going to agree. It's about the user experience, the on-ramp and the off-ramp. This is for people who will use crypto. Um, and I mean this not just from a consumer point of view, but as a game developer, if I'm running a platform and I'm trying to persuade game developers to accept cryptocurrency for a payment, well, as a, I'm a developer myself originally, you know, I pay my staff in, you know, in pounds or dollars. I don't want to take exchange rate risks. So I... I might go, oh, well, I'm okay using this platform to sell some assets like that, that might attract a good audience, but when that you know, 100 Ether or 10 Ether comes into me, I want to receive that in sterling at, and it priced correctly at that point in time. And there are companies that are doing this, but it's all still fragmented and messy and the regulations and iffy and um, the off-ramp and the, the on-ramp and the off-ramp affects developers as much as users and it's still not right yet. There are many companies working on it, um, but we're not there. Thank you. You've answered it, really. I think in terms of the, the growth in, in just the whole general market, I think games will lead it. At the moment, it's only really games that are now coming through where you can spend the currency that you invested in, apart from fintech and banking wallets. Um, it, is, it is games that, that will lead this. Um, I'm not sure what other vertical and what other sector will be next, but I've read some mad ICOs <laughs> and looked at it and gone, that's not for me, but... You know, you've got to make that decision. I just want to add one point as to where there are opportunities. Um, there's no, at the moment, as far as I'm aware, as far as cryptocurrency is concerned, certainly, there's no major platform holder anywhere that's um, at least being open about what's going on. There's a couple of things going on behind the scenes. And so you know, if you're trying to do a game and it's using, it's using cryptocurrency and you're on the iPhone, I mean, you know what the limitations are, and there are limitations, and it's quite annoying <laughs> because it restricts innovation and it's not like we're trying to do them out of money even we just don't even have the options it'd be nice to see some more engagement from that point of view just to make sure we can use app store for payments and so on that's great um tony uh 
You, you mentioned that you know everyone's aligned in the ecosystem. Does that mean you're, you're paying your employees in tokens now? I would do. I've, I've actually paid them in bitcoins. <laughs> so I wish I hadn't. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, why not? It, it, absolutely. I think every business in the next 10 years should have its own token. And, it, and again, it's been around for years. You know, it's like when you walk onto the, the pier in Brighton and you go to the end and you pay your 20 pounds, you get 20 tokens. That peer has put the value of that token at a pound, and you've agreed to buy it. It's, it's no different to before, so, except someone's going to buy it and go, I really hope this roller coaster goes up in price in the future, and I'm going to sell it for a profit. It's no, no different, but it's logged. You know, it's ledgered on the blockchain. So let me share, because I just came back from uh, China and, and talking to some friends who are in charge of the big enterprise, such as a huge insurance company, huge marketing, digital marketing companies. You know what? Enterprises are thinking about using blockchain for, you know what? Organization behavior and incentive. And it, they are not going to plan to go to ICO, but they are using this fundamental fundamental technology, like you said. Bitcoin gaming just are just different use case. The way I see crypto uh, gaming, the industry, it's just going to be like a mobile game. In the beginning of the mobile game, it's all lightweight, casual game. Who would have th thought that mobile game, casual game, would be 51% female playing it, right? Who would have thought of that? That's where the opportunity is. I'm going to go after the female uh, uh, players on the lightweight casual crypto games. Thanks guys, thanks for everything. Thanks for the panel. Everyone, round of applause.